Welcome to the third video on the subject of general chemical equilibria. And remind yourself again, we're talking about balance. There are two extreme cases that we want to consider for KEQ. The first of these is when KEQ is very, very small. We write KEQ is very much less than 1. In this case, when KEQ is very small, how small is very small? 10 to the negative fourth or smaller, then we would argue that very little reaction occurs. Remember, the equilibrium constant is the ratio of products to reactants. So it's products divided by reactants. When that ratio is very, very small, that means we have very few products. The top, the numerator is small, and the bottom is very, very large. The denominator is large, so the ratio is tiny. Our argument is then that the equilibrium amount of our reactant is essentially just going to be our initial concentration of the reactant because very little of it reacts. Here's an example problem. Let's calculate the equilibrium concentration of hydronium in this reaction if the initial concentration of HF is one molar. So here's our rice table, reaction, initial, change, equilibrium. We put our initial conditions in. Those are our givens. Here's the table again. And now we're going to say, all right, what's our change row? Well, how much changes? We know it's not much, but it's a real number. Let's let X equal the concentration of HF that reacts. So that means the change for HF is going to be negative X. It's a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So that's going to be positive X. And that's going to be positive X. So we do the common math, co column math. 1 minus X is 1 minus X. 0 plus X is X. And 0 plus X is X. Now our assumption is that the initial and equilibrium constants are going to be essentially equal. So what we're saying is that 1 minus x is essentially still just 1. That gives us this modified change table with the assumed value. The concentration of HF at equilibrium is essentially 1. Here this is x and that's x. We put those values into our KEQ expression. There's products, hydronium and fluoride, hydronium times fluoride over reactants, HF. So that's products, pardon me, products, yes, over reactants. We plug in, that's X times X divided by one is equal to KEQ. That's given in our problem statement. Or X squared is equal to 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus fourth. If we take the square root of both sides, we get that the hydronium concentration is 0 0.026. Now, is that a, that's the answer we got. Is it correct? Well, let's check our assumption. Our assumption was that 1 minus x is essentially 1. Is it? Is 0.974 essentially 1? Well, our difference is only 2.6% between those two numbers. And so we're going to argue that our answer is yes. If the error or the difference is less than 5%, then we're going to argue that the assumption is valid. Okay, if that error is larger than that, then we wouldn't make the assumption. Now, we don't have to. We can just use 1 minus x. We get this equation. It's quadratic. And we can use the quadratic formula to solve it. If we do so, we get a value of 0 0.0254 rather than 0 0.026. These two values differ only by 1.18%. So if we had used the quadratic formula, we would have gotten 0 0.025 to three decimal places. We got 0 0.026. So again, we're going to argue close enough. So our assumption holds, and we can accept this value. 
Are other extreme cases when KE2 is, KEQ is very, very large, very much greater than 1? How big is that? 10 to the third or greater. So if our equilibrium constant is 1,000 or greater, we're going to make this assumption. The reaction essentially goes to completion, at least as far as the limiting reagent allows, so that the equilibrium pressure or concentration of the limiting reagent is essentially zero. We'll call it X, it's a small number, and it will be our unknown, and we'll solve for it. Here's an example problem. Let's calculate the equilibrium constant of free silver if the initial concentration of silver is 0.5 and the initial concentration of our other reactant, ammonia, is 2. Now notice the equilibrium constant, 1.6 times 10 to the 7th, or if you prefer, 16 million. Okay, That is a huge equilibrium constant. That means we should get almost all product and very little reactant left. So here's our, equilib here's our rice table with the givens. And now let's calculate the change. Well, we're arguing here that almost all the silver reacts. So that's minus 0.5. There's twice as much ammonia, so twice as much reacts. The ratio is 1 to 2 to 1. So my change row is 1 to 2 to 1. 1 times 0.5, 2 times 0.5, 1 times 0.5. If we do the column math, the equilibrium constant here, pardon me, the equilibrium value here is essentially 0. We call it x. 2 minus 2 times 0.5, so 2 minus 1 is 1. And 0 plus 5 is 0.5. We're going to plug those values into our equilibrium constant. Here are my equilibrium values. This is going to be the concentration of this complex ion divided by the concentration of silver times the concentration of ammonia squared. I forgot to put the two there in the notes. I wrote it in there. There we go. Times the concentration of ammonia squared. So that's going to be 0.5 divided by x times 1 squared is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the 7th, or 0.5 over x is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the 7th. So x is going to be then 0.5 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the 7th. I've solved this equation for x. When we do the math, the math is tells me that x, the concentration of silver, is 2.9 times 10 to the negative 8th. Is that essentially 0? Well, the question is, is this number... Is that essentially zero? Yes. If I told you, if I told you that you owed me point zero 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 two nine dollars, you would go, I don't owe you anything, and I would go, you're correct. That's essentially zero. Now let's note in this case, if I don't make the assumption, I have to solve. I have to solve a fourth order equation in X. Okay? And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that because that's just going to be ugly. Pardon me, be a third order equation in X. That's fine. We still don't want to solve a cubic equation. Again, when KEQ is very, very large, our assumption is that all of the limiting reagent reacts. There's a little bit left over. We call it X and we solve for it. So this is relatively straightforward. The last topic in equilibrium that we want to discuss is called Le Chatelier's principle. Now I don't speak very I don't speak French very well, but Le Chatelier, okay, his principle. Basically, he's asking how does an equilibrium system react 
to stress. If I've got a system at equilibrium, how will it react? In simplest terms possible, a system, if it's initially at equilibrium, if stressed, will shift to counter that stress. Let's go back to that ball at the bottom of the valley. If I push it away from the equilibrium point, what's it try and do? Roll back. You've seen this principle in effect in your social interactions. If you've got a system that's stable and you introduce a change, we want to change it back. We want to go back to normal. Boy, we're living through that right now, aren't we? We would love things to go back to the way they were. We fight against these changes. Equilibrium systems are the same. The bottom line, what we do, the system tries to undo. Let's look at three cases. Material stress. That means if I add or subtract matter, if I add or remove a species in the KEQ, then the system will shift to remove or replace that species. Okay. If I add reactant, it will try and remove reactant. If I add product, it'll try and remove product. If I remove reactant, the system will shift to replace it. If I remove product, the system will shift to replace it. The second case is compressing or expanding the system, which is going to either raise or lower my pressure. If I compress a system at equilibrium, so I raise its pressure, it will shift to the lower the pressure back, and vice versa. The last stress is a thermal stress. If I heat a system at equilibrium, it will shift to consume that heat. If I cool a system at equilibrium, it will shift to produce heat. It's just trying to undo what I have done. Let's look at this reactive system. I've got nitrogen plus hydrogen makes ammonia. And this reaction is exothermic. It produces heat going from left to right. We can say it this way. Heat is a product. Now let's talk about three changes. If I add N2 to the system, then this system is going to shift to the right to remove the nitrogen. If I remove hydrogen, a reactant, then this system will shift left to produce or to replace the hydrogen that I have removed. It's just trying to undo what I have done. If I compress the system, I'm going to raise the total pressure. This system is going to shift to the right because there are fewer gas phase moles that lowers the pressure. Notice on the left-hand side of the equation, there are four gas moles. On the right-hand side of the equation, there are two gas moles. High pressure is going to favor the side with fewer moles. Low pressure is going to favor the side with more moles. So if this system is at equilibrium and I press on it, I raise the pressure, it's going to shift to the right to lower the pressure back again. Finally, if I heat this system, I'm adding heat. It's a product. That means the system is going to shift to the left to remove some of that added heat. If I cool this system, it's going to shift to the right to produce the heat that I am removing. Again, in all cases, what we do, the system tries to undo. That's Le Chatelier's system, Le Chatelier's principle. If I stress a system at equilibrium, it shifts to undo that stress or to counter that stress. What I do, it tries to undo. 
That, this concludes our introduction into equilibrium. We'll next take up applications look specific, looking specifically at acid-base equilibria.